Hey guys, it's Mr. Vedi, and let's get started with our next lesson. This lesson will be covering E, continuous compound interest, and continuous exponential growth and decay. Alright, first is this little uh, number we have here. This is called E, and it's approximately equal to 2.718281828484 and so on. E is actually what we call our natural base and a nat as a natural base it is an irrational number we represent this number 2.718281828 as e we can use e as a base so think of e kind of like pi e is just a number and we can use it like a base and when we use it as a base meaning that we'll have a variable in the exponent when we use it as a base the function is called a natural base exponential function. Because E is a natural base, we call it a natural base exponential function. And it also has the same characteristics of a basic exponential function when you graph it. So what are the characteristics? Well, we know that it's continuous from negative infinity to infinity, and its domain is all real numbers. So it looks very similar to a regular exponential function. And now we're going to see E being used in practice. So say I have f of x equals e to the x minus 2. My parent function will be f of x equals e to the x. And remember, we call that the natural base exponential function. So what transformations have happened? Or translations? Well, I subtracted 2, and notice where I subtracted 2 from. I subtracted 2 within my parent function. So I subtracted 2 up where the exponent is. So when I subtract 2, just like any other exponential function, that means that I'm going to shift my graph two units, and as you guys probably already guessed it, two units to the right. So same rule applies here for normal function values and exponential functions when we're talking about shifting. So let's look about a bit more challenging one. I have negative e to the 4x plus 2. Now, you may want to do yourself a favor, pause the video, and try figuring out the transformations that are happening here, or the translations. Um, I'm just going to tell you I see 3. So go ahead, try pausing and figuring it out. All right. Well, when I look at this, I see three things that are happening here. First thing I'm going to notice is that I see this negative sign right there. So if I see a negative sign, I'm going to look at where is my negative sign located. Is it within my parent function? Remember, my parent function is e to the x. Or is it outside of? Is it being multiplied by my parent function? Well, I think it's pretty obvious that it's outside. I mean, it's not up in the exponent, so it's outside of my parent function. So whenever I multiply by a negative, and it's outside of my parent function, I'm going to flip it over the x-axis. So this is a flip over my x-axis. Alright, I'm going to continue moving on. I'm going to see what else happens in this graph. Well, my parent function is e to the x. Notice up here I have a 4x. So that x is being multiplied by a 4. I notice that my 4 is being multiplied directly within my parent function. Now if it's directly within my parent function, that means it's the first thing I'm going to perform, it's the first operation I'm going to perform on my variable. That means if we look back at the flow chart from the last unit, that's a horizontal, a horizontal transformation. What kind of horizontal transformation? Well, once I know it's horizontal, I know that if a is greater than 1, if that number is greater than 1, it's going to be in compression. And if a is between 0 and 1, then it's going to be a expansion. So I'm going to look up here. 4 is greater than 1. It's within the parent function. So this is going to be a horizontal, a horizontal compression. All right, so that's 1, that's 2. What's my third? Well, I have this plus 2 out here. 
Notice the plus 2 is outside of my function. The plus 2 is outside of my function. Therefore, it's going to be going up or down. Since it's an addition, it's going to be going up. So it's going to be shifted up two units. All right. Make sure to write this down if you haven't already. So we're going to see how we can actually use E now in what we've been going over this entire uh, unit, which is let's look at it being used in practical applications. So we're in a it feels good to be a banker unit. I should probably use green for money. And let's go and check out how this is used in financial application. So I have continuously compounded interest. So make sure, pause the video for a moment before I go over it and write down the formula and what the formula stands for. All right, continuously compounded interest is when you have interest compounded. And recall before how we had semi-annual and we had annual and quarterly and monthly and daily compounded interest. That was when we had an interest rate and it would compound at a certain rate. Now we have at a certain rate over a certain period of time. In continuously compounded interest, we're going to use E. E essentially is telling us that we're going to compound this interest and it's going to, it's going to start accumulating interest every single day of every year. So this is happening continuously. So whenever you see a problem that says interest is getting compounded continuously, this is your keyword, you're going to use this formula. And it's A equals P E to the RT. And some people just say per to remember it very quickly. P is going to be our principal payment, so that's our initial amount. E, we already know what E is, that's not a variable, that's that natural base. And we have that uh, button on our calculator, actually, if you press second in the division key, that's your E key. We have R, which is our interest rate. T is a time in years. And A is going to be our accrued total, our final amount, our future value. So let's try a problem with this. Make sure you have this written down. All right. So Melody invests $2,000 in a savings account with a continuously compound interest rate of 3%. Probably save up to, for her massive earrings. So we first need to identify my P. So I see $2,000, that's what she initially invests, so that's going to be my principal payment. So my principal payment is going to be the amount of $2,000. My rate, well it tells me that it's an interest rate of 3%. So remember you always have to convert your interest rate, it's going to be converted to 0.03. Now, it tells me that it's being compounded, but it says continuously. So that tells me immediately, hey, I'm going to use that formula right there. I'm going to use E. As soon as I see continuously, that's an indication in my head. I'm going to be using E. All right, write an exponential function to represent this data. Well, we don't know what N is because we don't know what our final amount is. And we're going to set that equal to our principal, 2,000, multiplied by E because we know it's being continuously compounded. And it's going to be raised to the rate multiplied by the time. We don't know the time yet, but we do know what the rate is. And the rate is 0 0.03. So we have 2,000 times E raised to the 0 0.03 times T. And our next, next question is going to help us fill in that T. It says, how much money will Melody have if she, sorry about that Melody, if she keeps her money in this certified deposit for 10 years. So that should be saving the count, sorry guys. All right, so let's look at the setup of this problem. We have 2000 times E to the 0 0.03 multiplied by 10. So in my calculator very quickly, I'm just gonna type this in to make sure I have this right. And I need to get my E key, so you're gonna press that second division key and then raise that to 0 0.03 times 10 and I get indeed $2,699 and I round it up 72 cents. Alright, so make sure to write this down for any notes. And let's look at another application of exponential growth and decay. So we just did interest payments, so that's really financial. 
with exponential growth and decay, we can use this continuous model as well. We can use E as well. Now, sometimes some things grow continuously. So there's not a set amount of time that it happens under. It continuously grows. And things that are like population do that. So we need to have a uh, proper formula. This is our proper formula. It's going to be n, which equals our final amount, n sub 0, which is our initial amount. That's the, start we, the amount we start out with. It's going to be e because it's continuous. And it's going to be raised to the k, which is our continuous growth and decay rate. This is pretty much the same thing as r, guys, just written in a different way. And multiplied by t, and that's the time in years. If k is going to be greater than 0, it's a growth rate. And if k is less than 0, it's a decay rate. So make sure you write this down in your notes. And let's get started with an example. All right. Mexico has a population of 110 million people. Mexico's population grows continuously at 1.43%. What will their population be? So before it asks us, anything it just wants us to identify my variables. So I'm first going to look here and what information do they give us? Well they tell me the initial population. They tell me the initial population is 110 million people. So I know that that's going to go under my initial and as a reminder my formula is this right here. So this is going to be my initial. I don't need to know anything about E because I already know that's a natural base. I'm going to get it in my calculator. It's 2 point whatever. My K is 0 0.0143. I'm going to plug that into K. And they haven't asked me for a time yet, so I can just leave that as T as my variable. So when I write this out in an exponential function, it's going to be N equals 110 million times E raised to the 0 0.0143 multiplied by the time. All right, so we need to know the time, and the question is asking us, what will the population of Mexico be in 10 years according to the growth model? All right, well, let's plug in 10 to our T, and we can get rolling. 110 million multiplied by E raised to the 0 0.0143 times 10. So I'm going to type this in my calculator, and let's see what I get. 110 million multiplied by... E, so second that division key, raised to the 0 0.0143 times 10. And I get a population of 1,269,926,900,000. people. So I just round this to 9 because we're talking about people, so let's just round up. Alright, so that's the population of Mexico in 10 years, and we did this continuously. Alright, I have a one last slide for us to concentrate on, and I want you guys, if you've watched this video, to come to me before first period tomorrow, and I need you to pick up a sheet of paper so you can write down these formulas. We've already gone through every single one of these formulas before, and I want you guys to be able to create a sheet that has all of these formulas on it. So again, you need to come to my room before first period and pick up a sheet of paper so you can write these formulas out, and you're going to make a 4x4 four four grid with all these formulas on it. Alright, have a great day guys, and I'll see you tomorrow.